Please join me in introducing Ryan Holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys for having me. I did not know I'd done five Google Talks. That's pretty nuts. Uh, I'll, I'll keep writing books if you guys keep having me to talk. It's always fun. Um, so we're going to talk today about stillness. And I think when you hear this word stillness, uh, it might sort of bring up some, some, some different images. Maybe you're thinking of this, or you're thinking of this, or if you ask my dad, maybe you're thinking more of this. Uh, but but I, I'm not that interested in that kind of stillness, although that, those certainly are forms of stillness. I'm, I'm interested in what you might call active stillness. So I'm interested in the stillness of uh, John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm interested in the stillness of Mr. Rogers, um, it, the, the stillness of someone who has that kind of energy. Uh, I talked to my wife about this. Uh, the energy of, um, my son goes to daycare on South Lamar, the, the, the energy of, that it takes to put 15 toddlers down for a nap at the exact same time. Um, the, the, en the energy of, of Mr. Rogers when you watch an episode of it, or if you, you watch it on the phenomenon that, that Google helped unleash in my home, which would be like a blippy, let's say. The, the energy of Mr. Rogers compared to Blippi, I'm, I'm interested in the Mr. Rogers energy. I'm interested in the energy of, of, of Anne Frank sitting down in her journal. Despite all of the craziness and the horrors of the outside world, how is someone able to find a center, to find stillness, to slow down, to clarify their thinking, to calm their emotions, and, and, and get to a, a, a good place even if the outside place is not so great? Um, so I'm interested in stillness for the real world, right? And, and it happens that all the different major philosophical schools and religions have their own word for this stillness. I won't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce any of these. Um, mostly I, I write about stoicism. The, the two stoic concepts are apatheia and ataraxia. It means to not be jerked around by internal forces and not be jerked around by external forces. So my definition of stillness is like, how is someone steady even when the world is spinning very quickly around you? Um, how to act without frenzy, how to hear only what needs to be heard, how to have sort of equanimity and poise, uh, interior and external, uh, and exterior on command. Um, in the Tao Te Ching, their definition, I think this is beautiful, uh, careful as someone crossing an iced over stream, alert as a warrior in enemy territory, courteous as a guest, fluid as melting ice, shapeable as a block of wood, receptive as a valley, clear, of a gla clear as a, a glass of water. I think that's Kennedy in the Missile Crisis. That's Mr. Rogers personified. That's Anne Frank. Um, that's what I aspire to be like in my own life. Uh, the Stoics were a little bit more laconic and, and less uh, beautifully uh, written uh, than, than the Buddhists and the Confucius, uh, but I think capture stillness in its own uh, unique way. Marx Aurelius writes, to be like the rock that the waves keep crashing over, it stands unmoved and the raging of the sea stills around it. So what I thought I would do today, I'm not going to walk you through the book, I thought I'd just walk you guys through 10 or 11 very real strategies to access this kind of stillness in the real world in the midst of a busy day, a busy life, a chaotic time in the world. And my promise to you, I will not tell you to meditate uh, because Chances are you're not going to do it. Uh, and so what are other active, easier ways to get to that stillness? So the keys to stillness uh, that I practice in my own life that I think you guys can practice in your life are as follows. So the first is get up early. Um, the earlier you wake up, the stiller it is. I love the sound and the feel and the quiet of the, the house before anyone else has awoken, before the phone has started ringing. Uh, before the emails have started coming in. This morning I got up at around six. I do have a, a three-year-old and a five-month-old, so uh, it does handle the getting up early for me uh, most mornings. But the point is you want to get up early and you want to start whatever you're doing as early as possible in this stillness. So the idea of waking up early before the distractions, before the impositions is really important. Uh, slight tip, for instance, uh, I'm very anti-breakfast meetings. Uh, I don't want to start the day doing something uh, like that. I want to start the day with whatever my sort of creative practice or my most important work task is. So I get up early, and then my corollary to this rule 
uh, is let us start the day phone free. So my rule is that I don't touch the phone for the first 30 minutes to one hour that I'm awake. I use an app called Spar. Uh, I, I started, it was 10 minutes, and then I worked my way up to 20 minutes, and then 30 minutes, and then an hour. This morning, I didn't touch my phone for the first two and a half hours that I was awake. The first thing I had to use was Google Maps to figure out where I was going. Uh, I feel like that doesn't totally count. But the point is, I want to start the day from a not, I don't, I, the, the amount of people I know whose the quality of their day is determined by whether Donald Trump went on a tweet storm while they were sleeping, um, or whether somebody from work sent them a bunch of emails, uh, where they got a bunch of unsolicited texts. We start the day too often from our back foot, right? Because instead of going into the day intentionally, we are reactive. So I use SPAR. What, what SPAR did uh, for me is it put a, 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 it gamified the idea of, of not using the phone. So uh, basically, when you wake up, uh, you, you, don't, uh, you don't touch the phone, and then you have to check in on the app when you use your phone for the first time. And if you check in more than, uh, you know, you've, you've not been up for 30 or 40 minutes or whatever it is, it charges you money. And then so the idea was uh, all the, the, the winners of the challenge, you made it all the way through split the pot at the end. So I found I'm using technology to help beat my, technolo my technology addiction, uh, but that's fine as long as it gets me where I want to go. But, but the point is, I don't want to, I don't want to be reactive. I don't want to be responding. I want, if I'm waking up early so I can be in the right place so things can be still and quiet, the worst thing I can do would be to pull up technology that's telling me that that's not a good way to be, right? So I want to start um, phone free. But what do I do if I'm not using my phone, right? This is crazy. Uh, the first thing I do in the morning is I go outside. Uh, so we waited for it to be light this morning and then I took my son for a long bike ride. We, we, were, we were out for about an hour. Um, we, we go outside, we live on a dirt road not far from Austin. And being outside, uh, this is a photo from a different trip, but I don't even take the phone, which means sometimes I experience things that I can't take pictures of, and I just have to be present for it like every other human being for all of human history up until a few years ago. But, but the point is I want to just actually be, and we talk, sometimes we don't talk, we see things, we watch the sun go up, it's just quiet and still and wonderful, even though, paradoxically, we are in some form of movement. So I go for uh, this bike ride or I go for this walk, um, and it's, it's wonderful. And then I return home, and the first thing I do with this energy, again, is not go straight to the phone. I don't want to waste this on, on email or social media. I want to use this. I want to start putting this energy into something productive. So the first thing I do is sit down with a journal. Um, I, have two, I have two or three journals that I use. I use one called the, the um, One Line a Day Journal. And you write one sentence each day for five years. So you can see on the page what you've been doing on this exact date. Uh, for the last five years. I've been doing it for like three and a half years. So I can see uh, where I was on this day in history, the day before, the year before that. It's really wonderful. Then I go and I just write, write in a random uh, Moschine, just things that I'm thinking about, things that I'm working on, things that I'm struggling with, things that I want to get better at. And then I do uh, the Daily Stoic Journal, uh, which uh, it is my journal, so it's somewhat weird. But uh, it's just giving you a prompt. It gives you a sort of a philosophical, uh, philosophically inspired prompt for the day that you sort of set your intention for, and then the idea is that you revisit that in the evening or the following day just to see how you did. So I want to start my day sort of intentionally. And it might seem weird as a writer that I would start the day by writing, but it's actually kind of just a warm up. Um, what, what's really interesting about philosophy is that that's what Marcus Aurelius' Meditations was. It's one of the few philosophical books that we have that wasn't published as a book. He wasn't, the, the most powerful man in the world wasn't writing what he thought. He was writing what he felt he needed to know for himself, and it's only a complete accident that this work survives to us. He'd probably be mortified that we're reading his, his diary or journal, but he's dead, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> the, the point is, it, it's, philosophy is not just this thing you read about one time and understand. It's an active practice. It's something you're doing with yourself. It's a dialogue with oneself. I talked about the missile crisis a little bit. Um, what I think is so fascinating about the missile crisis is that we have Kennedy's doodles and notes from the missile crisis on legal pads. He would write these things to himself, sort of reminders. He would write missile, 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 or he'd write consensus, consensus, consensus. He was journaling out, working out what he was thinking as he was thinking it. Journaling is not the only way to do this. I know people that doodle in the morning or sketch, but the point is to have kind of a, a, a creative practice 
um, where there are very low stakes, and it's just sort of a getting the juices flowing. Uh, Julia Cameron calls uh, morning pages a sort of a form of spiritual windshield wipers, and I really like that analogy. Kennedy really liked uh, boating, and so he drew these pictures of sailboats. You can imagine the entire world is about to blow itself up, if he, and if he's not careful, he's going to contribute to that. The, the idea of, of just getting out of that, zooming out, think, sort of calming his mind, you can see what, how valuable and important that would be. Um, and Frank writes that paper is more patient than people. And so when you think about the stresses of the missile crisis, it makes sense why he's writing on, he, he wants to dump out his anger and his frustration and his fears and the ideas that he's workshopping where there are low stakes so he can perform better where there's really high stakes. So I think journaling is a really important part of it. Um, then the, the, my rule is you do the main thing right away. So the point of not using the phone, going outside, journaling, it's, this is all about warming up for the most important part of the day, whatever that is. So again, Probably a breakfast meeting, not the most important thing of the day, right? Responding to emails, not the most important thing to the day. Uh, you know, calling, uh, you know, calling the airline to move your, you, you know, move your ticket. Uh, the, the sort of painful, frustrating things, going to the bank, these are not the things you want to start the day with. You want to get the most important thing out of the way as soon as possible. So my to-do list, I write them on four by six note cards. It's really just a handful of things. So I have six things on my to-do list. I think when you find really successful people um, who, who do a lot, you find that they're not actually doing a lot, they're just doing a handful of important things. So if I do these six things today, that will be a successful thing for me, a successful day for me. Some of these are really important, some of them are like administrative. So the first thing I did this morning when I got up and did all my stuff was then I had an article to write, I had an email for Daily Stoic to write, and, and I crossed those off early. If I showed you my to-do list now, you would see that all the important things of this list are, um, are, are, are finished. And the, the, the reason for doing that is that I control, like, I feel like you control the early part of the day, but as the day goes through, uh, the, the, your, your, your grip on the day is loosening, right? Because things, things happen, uh, you don't feel good, you know, somebody comes into your office with a problem, you get stuck in traffic, whatever, right? The, 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 the complexity of the day, entropy enters the longer you're at it. And so if I can win the morning, if I can do the most successful things early when I'm coming at it from a good place, then, uh, then the rest of the day is extra, right? I could write at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, but the chances of me being in the right headspace, me having the, that unprotected time at 2 p.m. in the afternoon is much lower. So I want to do it at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m., get it done, get as much of it as possible done. And then if I have a great window at 2 p.m., maybe I'm going to keep going. But I want to get the, early, the important thing done as soon as possible. And, and I, I, I like to not have a list of 100 things, but like a couple core things, consider that a win. You keep going, right? You want to uh, um, run up the score as much as possible, but you have to win first, right? Routine, extremely important uh, as far as stillness goes, right? You might think that people who get to do whatever they want, uh, who, you know, a, a lot of you guys I'm sure have the freedom to work from home, or you get to determine largely your schedule, or if you're a creative like me, you get, that's the, one of the perks of the job. But I find so many people struggle at this because they embrace uh, the, 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 this sort of freedom becomes chaos for them. I, I love uh, the Eisenhower quote. He said, freedom is best defined as the opportunity for self-discipline, right? So how do you create order amidst the abundance or freedom that you have as far as the, the, the 24 hours that we get in each day? So order is really important. I look at someone like Winston Churchill. How did he do so much? How did he accomplish so much? He gave thousands of speeches. He served in government for like 60 or 70 years. He wrote uh, something like 10 million words. He painted 500 paintings. How did he do all this? He was a uh, creature of routine. He woke up at the same time every day. He did the same thing. He took a bath at the exact same temperature every day. He liked to do somersaults in the bath, so they had to reinforce the floor under the bathtub because he splashed too much water. Um, 
He, he wrote uh, in the morning, then he wrote a little bit in the afternoon, then he did a sprint before bed. He, uh, he uh, read newspapers at the same time. He responded to correspondence at the same time. He was just a, a complete habit and creature of routine. And I think most great people are. It's about having a practice. And so like, you do something a couple times, it becomes a habit. Do it a lot of times, it becomes a routine. You do it over your life or you do it over decades, I think it turns into ritual. It becomes almost a sacred experience. And so writing is that for me. Some of the other stuff we'll talk about is, is that for me. But you do it enough times, you do it in the right order, it becomes almost sacred, right? And you don't want to break from it. Um, well, I'll talk about relationships, but my favorite part of Churchill's routine uh, is he said, spouses should not see each other before noon. Um, he's like, this is the key to a happy marriage, uh, which, which I love. But the point is, do it whatever way works for you. There are people who are night owls. Great. Ignore the, the wake up early thing. But the point is, what order are you doing these things? And doing them in the same order, doing them the same way, allows you to reduce the complexity and chaos and indecision. You know, people like Steve Jobs wearing the same thing every day. Obama famously chose between two suits every day, right? And then that one day he wore a brown suit and everyone lost their mind. Um, <laughs> That's not why we're having a routine. It's not for other people, but it's for us. It's to reduce that sort of reaction inside ourselves. Um, something I don't do on purpose every day is I don't watch the news. I don't watch the news for a lot of reasons. Uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was traveling recently. Uh, you know, you walk through the airport. It's hard not to watch the news. Why? Because CNN pays the major airports to to run CNN. It's a special version of CNN that never shows anything about airplane crashes. Um, but, but the point is, the news is not there to inform you. The news is there to make you watch more news, right? And I think, there are, I, I think it's important to be an informed citizen, uh, but I think the news is often the worst possible way to get informed, at least uh, consuming news in real time moment, right? Um, the importance of hobbies is a big part of my day is this. It was a big part of Winston Churchill's day. After the First World War, he suffered a little bit of a nervous breakdown, and his sister-in-law came to him and gave him uh, her children's paint set. She said, my kids have a lot of fun with these. Maybe it would be helpful for you. And he picks up painting, and he paints for the rest of his life, um, uh, particularly in stressful times. After the Casablanca conference, where all the, all the allied powers get together, Churchill drives five hours to paint a picture of uh, a sunset in Marrakesh. Right? He, think of everything that is resting on his shoulders. Think about all the stress. But he's taking time to disconnect. He's taking time to do something that seemingly has nothing to do with being prime minister, but in fact it has everything to do with being prime minister because it calms him down. It allows him to think clearly. The idea of disconnecting um, and, and finding restoration in hobbies is really, really important. Me, I like fishing. This is our farm. Uh, it's got enormous fish in it, and they can't go anywhere, so it's really easy. <laughs> Um, but like working on the farm, you'd think would be the opposite of writing, and that's why I love it. It is the opposite of writing. People go, oh, is it having a farm a lot of work? And it's like, yes, but it's so different than my normal work that I often have all sorts of breakthroughs uh, professionally, personally, when I'm in the middle of doing something that seems very unrelated. So whether it's feeding the cows or fixing fences, the, 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 the act of doing something so different than my creative profession uh, helps replenish and restore me. Churchill actually wrote a book called Painting as a Pastime, and he says the highest priority for a public person is to have two or three hobbies, and he said they should all be real. And I think what he means is like, your hobby can't be following the news, right? Your, your, your hobby has to be like uh, painting or sculpting or metalwork. Uh, one of Churchill's other hobbies was bricklaying. He learned how to lay bricks, and he would build. Uh, he built a series of cottages on his estate in the English countryside that stands to this day. And it was not just the hobby; it was it was getting outside, it was getting in the dirt, it was uh, being lost in something very small. Again, where the stakes were very low, uh, his daughters would help him. So it was a family affair. But the the point is, the the hobby is a is a way to rest the mind. In the ancient world, uh, leisure was not doing nothing, leisure meant sort of school, right? That school, uh, it, school it, it means at learning, right? So it should be a, a thing that challenges you, that gets you better, uh, or that, that, that makes you better. And I think this is really important. Actually, Aristotle said, the main question of life is what is our leisure time filled with? 
And so it can't be more work. It has to be something different. And, and the studies they've done of like uh, CEOs and high-level executives, their hobbies tend to be something, and a friend of mine made this observation, of uh, they tend to be something uh, defined by the absence of voices, right? So something quiet that where you lose your mind and yourself in it, so that's fly fishing or uh, riding bikes or, uh, or you know, hiking, um, it's, it's probably not partying or going to nightclubs or something like that, right? It's something restorative and creative. But the, the power of hobbies is really important. Um, I think exercise and hobbies are, are related, but, but the idea of being active, it's, again, paradoxically, uh, movement is a great way to get to stillness. Um, my favorite way, uh, uh, my favorite form of exercise uh, for stillness would be swimming. And Austin, I have to say, is the most underrated swimming uh, town in America, which is interesting because we're totally landlocked. But Barton Springs, to me, is a, is a wonder of the earth. Where else can you swim in an eighth of a mile long uh, pool that's the same temperature all year round? It's, it's, it's the, Barton Springs is the same temperature whether it's 105 out or whether it's snowing out. And I've been there when it was snowing. Um, it, it's, it's just amazing, and, and so I love, I love swimming. There's no screens underwater, right? I think it's great. I don't know why people are trying to make uh, these waterproof iPods happen. Uh, the whole point is that you can't listen to music underwater. I think that's what's so great about it. Um, but I, I, just, I just love, I love swimming. I, it's, it's repetitive enough, but it's also low, low impact. There's like a sensory deprivation element to it, right? Um, it's, uh, I think there's something sort of womb-like to it, which is why it's so therapeutic. But the point is, I try to swim every day. I'm gonna go swimming after this. I'll, I'll go to Deep Eddy or, or, or Barton Springs. Um, but, but Austin is a great, if, if you don't like swimming, but you, or if, you, if you've never been into swimming but you wanna try, Austin is like the best city in America you could do this to. Number two to me would be Sydney. If you've ever been to the rock pools uh, in, in Sydney, they're just amazing. Uh, Mr. Rogers, people don't know this. Mr. Rogers swam every day at the Pittsburgh Athletic Club. Uh, he, he had this whole ritual and this routine. He would sing a song to himself before he jumped. He would weigh himself, sing a song, jump into the water, swim, and then go to work, right? The power of routine, the power of ritual, but I think exercise uh, is such a great uh, part of this. What I love about exercise and, and, and having this as kind of your hobby or your thing you do every day, it's, it's a guaranteed win, right? <laughs> I've never gone swimming and then drowned. I've never gone, through, uh, never gone through a run and not made it home, right? I might go faster or slower, but it's like an item on the to-do list that if I start, I finish, right? And it gives me a lot of power and sort of control and a way to get a win. So it doesn't matter how stressful work was. It doesn't matter the bad news that I got. It doesn't matter that I messed this up or that up uh, or that you know, I just wasn't feeling and I, I didn't have a good I didn't have a good productive day, but I did manage to do this thing that I wanted to do. CrossFit's a great way to do this. I, I, I'm more of an introvert, so I hate CrossFit. But, um, <laughs> but the, the point is go do some form of exercise, get the endorphins flowing, but, but the, the movement is a, a, a beautiful way to get to um, that stillness. The power of relationships, the, I think one of the weirdest parts when you, you study Buddhism is this idea that to seek enlightenment Buddha walks away from his family. He had a young son and he was married. To me, that doesn't really seem like enlightenment. It seems like the opposite of enlightenment. It's like, oh, Buddha is a deadbeat. That's interesting. <laughs> um, but, but the power of relationships. People I hear that say, oh, I don't have time for relationships. I don't have room for relationships. I'm focused on my career right now. Actually, I think most of the successful people that you admire, that you look up to, uh, had uh, some sort of uh, relationship that was foundational in their life. You think of Angela Merkel and her husband. Um, you think of uh, great writers who had sort of an endlessly supportive wife. I, the power of relationships to me is a, is, a, is a source of stillness because it's someone who, has, who knows you very intimately but has the ability to give you perspective about your own life, your own habits, your own tendencies, someone that you can bounce stuff off to in a very safe way. Churchill said of, uh, that his greatest accomplishment was convincing uh, his wife Clementine uh, to marry him. And he's probably right, because she prevented him from committing career suicide many times. And so that having someone who's totally in your corner, again, who <laughs> understands you, who can calm you down, um, in, in Churchill's wilderness years, where he's basically exiled from political life, as a, as a sort of a go-getter, a person who hated to be on the sidelines, 
There were many times where he wanted to rush back in, where he was going to force his way back into politics. And it was his wife who was able to talk him down off this ledge every time. And it turned out to not just be the right decision for his career, but like all of humanity is in his debt. If, if, if he had been in politics or in power uh, while Hitler was ascendant, he would have been tossed out of office like everyone else. He was the, the power of waiting, the, the power of sort of having a home to rest in was deeply important. Uh, my wife's here today. She's been a huge part of my success. But the, the idea of having a relationship, I think, cannot be, uh, be uh, uh, more, it cannot be over, overstated enough. And again, whatever form it wants to come in for you, uh, uh, just th the point is being an island is, is a really bad way to do it. And then ultimately, even if it wasn't, if it helped you get everything you wanted, I mean, what's the point, right? Um, if, you're, if you're doing this all for yourself and you have no one to share it with in the end, is that, is that really what success looks like for you? Um, the power of saying no, again, is a big part of it, whether it's saying no to the news or saying no to all the things that are coming your way so you can focus on the things that matter. Um, a friend of mine gave me this uh, framed picture of Oliver Sacks, which has Oliver Sacks framed picture in it. But he had in his office a no, the, uh, just the word no, exclamation point, meaning you have to say no to almost everything that comes your way. Right? Early on in your career, you, you had to say yes to everything. That's how you got where you are. That's how you got here. But to now do what you do and to do it well, you have to say no to all the things that are not that thing. Um, I've, I've talked to lots of sports teams, and, and the performance coaches I talk, about, I talk to, particularly in baseball, stress this so much. They're like, look, to become great at sports, uh, particularly baseball, you, 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 you get great by swinging at pitches, right? That's how you make a name for yourself as a hitter. But once you make it to the major leagues, now it's all about plate discipline. Can you not swing at a pitch that's almost good enough so you're waiting for the perfect pitch, right? Can you not uh, fall for the, the deceiving pitches, the pitches that are designed to get you to swing that you actually have no chance of connecting with? This is really important. So for me, it's all about saying no. I don't say no enough, but uh, I feel like if I'd said uh, yes anymore, it would be a problem. Uh, but like, this is my calendar for today. Google Calendar, of course, the best calendar. <laughs> but I have, I have two things on my calendar. That's it. I actually tell my assistant if there's more than three things in the calendar, uh, something got messed up, right? Like my, my goal is to have as few things in the calendar as possible. When I look at my day and it's scheduled from 9 a.m. to you know, 9 p.m. or whatever, that's not only... Uh, not my idea of success, right? That's not winning, is I have to go do a bunch of things that other people want me to do. Um, but I'm not going to do well at any of those things. So I'm just going from appointment to appointment. Um, and so what, what my thinking is, if it's in the calendar, it means I'm not doing the main thing. I'm not writing. So it's awesome to be here today. But this, take, this took one hour from writing from me, right? And so having to actually think about it in terms of cost is really important. Having kids was really great for me in this sense too, right? Because um, it used to be you would say yes because you didn't want to say no to someone. You didn't want to hurt their feelings. But having uh, a kid sort of crystallizes who you're taking that time from, right? It's like, oh, I don't want to say no to this person because I don't want to hurt their feelings. But in, in, in doing that, I'm hurting the feelings of a two-year-old. Right? And who do I care about more, ultimately? Right? We, can, we can often not take care of ourselves, but if we can personify who saying no to uh, or saying yes to is hurting because you can't do everything, you can't be everywhere at once, is really, is really important. We're not good at calculating opportunity costs. So we say yes, we always think we can squeeze more stuff in, but what's harder to calculate is OK, now uh, in this meeting you had or this, this uh, this uh, presentation you are giving, or this uh, code you are sitting down to write, now you're coming to it at 90% capacity instead of 100% capacity. And it's really hard to, to calculate how, you know, what the costs of that are. So it's about saying no. So the question I like to leave people with is, is like, what are you saying no to so you can say yes to what matters, whether that's your work or your family or your health? You, you have to say no, because if you say yes, you will have no stillness. Um, Another important part is just the idea of letting go. Um, one of the most beautiful exercises in Stoicism is, is this exercise they call the dichotomy of control. And so they say, look, here's everything that's happening in the world in the course of a day, in the course of a moment, and then like, here's all the things that you control. Right? It's like a, a minuscule amount. You don't control what happens 
they say you control how you respond. And so accepting that a large amount of reality is just not up to us at all. We have no say over it. It's hugely important. And this is kind of why, I, I, this goes back to my thing of not watching the news. Is me watching this affecting the outcome in any way? No, right? If you're watching the debates because you actually want to know who you're going to vote for, great. Now you're using this information uh, in some way. If you're watching the debates for entertainment, guys, let me tell you, there's a lot better entertainment out there. Uh, there are professional people who entertain for a living, and you might enjoy that more than these other people. But so, so is this something you control? Is it up to you or not? This is a critical question, right? And if it's not up to you, you let go of it. You just don't care about it, right? It doesn't matter. It becomes irrelevant to you. And so this winnows the amount of things that you're focusing on, that you care about, that you have to be monitoring in your head, and then allows you to, um, to, to, to not only have stillness, but to be really locked in and 100% there for the things that you do control. So it's a, the, the, the dichotomy of control, it might seem like a powerlessness, right, or a resignation, but what it's doing is it's embracing the power you do have, right, where you do control things. And I think it's a resource allocation hack in the sense that most people are spending a good portion of their time caring about, working on, being anxious about things they don't control. And this comes at the cost of the things they do control. And so if, if, if we have a finite amount of energy, I want to focus that finite amount of energy exclusively on the area where it's likely to change it in one way or another. So if I have a 1% chance of influencing something, I want to bring 100% of myself to it. Um, being present, right, this is a really important part. And again, the dichotomy of control allows you to be present, right? You cannot change the past. You have no control over that. You have almost no impact on the future. But what you do control is like what's in front of you right now. And so the idea of being present, I think uh, Marina Abramovich's The Artist uh, is Present performance is maybe one of the greatest athletic feats of all time. She sat for like 80 consecutive days from morning until night uh, in a chair just looking, right? And people would cycle through and look at her for a few minutes. And just the being present is so rare uh, and so unusual that this was almost a religious experience for people. We have so little familiarity with presence that people would break down in tears just making eye contact with a person who was actually present. And if you think about how hard it is, like she can't be thinking about how long she's been at this. She can't be thinking about how long she has to go. She can't be thinking about how bored she is. She, she says, one of the hardest things to do is next to nothing. I would say one of the hardest things to do is just to be present in the moment, whatever you're doing, whether you're sitting in traffic, whether you're at the doctor's office, you know, whether you're on a, a phone call, right? Why do we multitask? It's because we're often drifting from the task we should be on, right? We're sitting on a conference call, and we're going to check some emails at the same time, right? Uh, you're you're uh, sitting uh, across from someone at dinner, and you're going to check your phone, right? You're going to try to do these things uh, at the same time because what you're really afraid of is being present. And I think that's so interesting because our power is in the present, right? You can't be great in the past or in the future. You can really only have control over who you are in this present moment. And it's, in a way, it's kind of arrogant, right? It's arrogant to think that you could be anything other than 100% at what you're doing and perform at a high level. Like, are you so talented that you can only partway show, show up for this, right? Um, or is there someone who wants this more than you, who is going to show up 100%, and are they going to eat your lunch, right? Um, the good news about the present, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll conclude with, with this a little bit, but the good news about the present is that it keeps showing up, right? And you can start fresh. Like if you, I said I wasn't going to talk about meditation, but I'm going to cheat a little bit. If, if, you've, if you ever have meditated or tried to count your breath or be fully present, you find yourself drifting, but you can always just start over, right? You can always just come back to it. And so presence is something you practice. You try to be present, and then you drift, and you come back to it. And so I try to remind myself constantly of the power of presence, of the importance of presence, to come back to it. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a muscle that you build up over time. And the final way that you get presence, I think, is through contentment, through enough. There's a story uh, with Joseph Heller. He's at a party with Kurt Vonnegut. They're at the house of this billionaire. Joseph Heller wrote Catch-22. Kurt Vonnegut wrote uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. 
And Kurt Vonnegut's teasing Joseph Heller. He says, how does it feel to know that this billionaire made more money this week than, you will, than your novel will make in your entire life? And Heller looks at him and he says, well, it doesn't feel great. Uh, but he's like, I have something that this guy will never have. And Kurt Vonnegut says, what could that possibly be? This guy has everything. And Heller says, I have enough, right? The idea of enough. Um, it's not that contentment uh, was complacency for Heller. He wrote many other books. They sold very well. His books were turned into movies. He taught classes. He was an active participant uh, at the highest level of his profession. But he was doing it from a place of fullness, from a place of enough, not from a place of craving or uh, insecurity. And I think ultimately our best work comes from that place of enough. If you're doing it because, oh, if I do this, then I will feel rich. Or if I make this or accomplish this, then my dad will be proud of me. These are really bad reasons to do things, right? Because those aren't things for you to earn. You're never going to fix internal uh, insecurity with external accomplishments, right? You have to slow down and find contentment in the present, right? Uh, with my books, I have to remind myself what I control is the writing. So I might as well enjoy this present experience. I might as well enjoy the writing. I don't control whether I'm going to be alive when it comes out. I don't control how many copies it's going to sell. I don't control whether it gets recognized by you know, this bestseller list or this awards body or committee. What I control is whether I'm enjoying it and bringing a, a full sense of myself to that present moment. Um, Tiger Woods, uh, he's here with his father. They look like they're having fun. His father was probably a psychopath. Uh, but his, <laughs> his, his, father, his father would refer to enough as the E word like it was a swear word. And so it shouldn't surprise us that for Tiger Woods, there was never enough. There wasn't enough affairs. There wasn't enough winning. There was never enough for him. And, and you can see where this made him great in the short term, but eventually it imploded and destroyed all the things that he'd worked so hard for. And then it's been a long process of rebuilding of which we are just now seeing the returns for. And it looks, and I don't know him, I'm, I'm looking at this like an outsider, it does look like the winning is different this time, right? The winning is coming not from a place of need, not from a place of domination or humiliation or, or you know, sort of endless greed, but coming from a place of actually enjoying the game and enjoying the process and just like, you can't, he, if, if he didn't actually enjoy golf for the, the experience of it, there's no way he could have gotten through that 10-year drought, right? So coming to it from a place of, of fullness is way better than the place of craving. So those are some, some tips for, for being still, slowing down, actively using this as a practice in real life. I don't think it's just closing your eyes and meditating. You magically have stillness. I think it's something you actively participate in that you cultivate on a daily basis. So I have one last story along these lines that sort of ties my routine together, which is that on my walks in the morning, uh, we often go and we find uh, Buddy. This is my donkey. His name's Buddy. We bought him on Craigslist for $100. Um, <laughs> if you've ever seen someone liquidating a petting zoo on Craigslist, uh, let me tell you, it was not a pretty sight. Uh, but we got him. He's awesome. And so we'll go out and see him, and uh, he just stands there a lot of times. Like, this is what he does. So I, sometimes he comes and visits us. He can open the back door of the house. But uh, we go and we visit him, and he's just standing there. And when I first uh, witnessed this, I thought, man, there's just nothing going on in this guy's head. Like, how is he standing there for so long? And then what I realized is that um, he's, like, doing his job. Like, this is his job. Uh, First off, donkeys are livestock guarding animals, so they keep um, you know, coyotes, and there's mountain lions in Texas, if any of you guys are new here. Like he's fought off a mountain lion before, uh, but they keep away mountain lions and coyotes and bobcats and stray dogs and all sorts of things that you don't want around cows or goats or anything like that. So he's just doing his job by being around. But as my pet, his main job, like a successful day for him, if he doesn't die, that's a successful day. That's all that it takes, right? Uh, he's not like comparing himself to the other donkeys. He's not wondering if he's living up to all his potential or anything. He's just present. He just is. He's just alive. As long as he's alive, that's a really successful day. Um, 
And so I, I try to actively sort of practice that kind of gratitude and that kind of simplicity. Um, there's a, uh, a park, between, a national park between Austin and Dallas, which I encourage everyone to visit. It's called Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, and you can walk out into this river and stand in a footprint left by a dinosaur 110 million years ago. There's a few of these in Texas. This is an, uh, actually a park. Uh, there's also a creationist museum across the street that denies that the footprint is 110 million years old. <laughs> Again, this is Texas. So, uh, but, but the point is, I, what I like, I like standing in it and just sort of imagining that this has been going on for however long, right? It's sort of this, it, it allows me to, to sort of uh, not care about the future, not care about the past, but just feel sort of deeply connected to something that's been here a very long time. And there's also a humility in it, right? Like, uh, no one in this room will leave a greater legacy on this planet that will last as long as this dinosaur has. Uh, that, so it sort of, it, I, I feel like it helps you connect, it, it helps you see a, a bigger picture. Sort of how ephemeral and, 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 um, and, and short-lived our time on this planet is, which is actually uh, the, the, the last practice I want to leave you guys with. Uh, I, I have a coin in my pocket and it says memento mori on, on it. And memento mori means remember death. And there's a quote on the back from Marcus Aurelius. He says, you can leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. And so the idea that life is very short, that it's very unpredictable, and it's ultimately very fragile, to me is a source not of anxiety or worry, but of, of stillness, right? Um, Seneca talks about how if we can balance the books of life each day, we're never short of time. And what he means is that you want to live each day as if it might be your last day. Not, if, not as if it is your last day for sure, because you don't know, but that it might be your last day. So you leave nothing unfinished. You don't waste time with worry or holding on to grudges. You, know, you, don't, you don't waste your time being overactive, but you also don't waste this moment not being active enough. And so this is a, is a, is a source of, of great stillness for me. Um, Unfortunately, he just passed, but there's a man named Richard Overton who lived in, in Austin, uh, not far from my, Aust my, my office in East Austin, and I would go and sit on his porch sometimes. He was 112 years old, and uh, I said, Richard, how do you live to be 112? Do you just take it day by day? And he was like, no, that's too long. You take it day by night. Uh, he's like, if I live through the night, that's great, and then I wake up in the morning, right? To me, this is the right attitude. This is the way to think about it. The, the final part from the Stoics, as far as memento mori goes, and what I try to think about with this coin, uh, Seneca talks about how you don't want to think of death as something that's off in the future, right? That, hey, we're going to live to be 75, so you subtract your current age, that's how many years you have left, right? He says, no, uh, death is something that is happening always, right? So he says, um, the, the time that has passed belongs to death. Like the 45 minutes that we just spent together is dead. It's dead time. We lost it. We all just died 45 minutes. So I hope it was worth it. <laughs> um, but, but his point is the time that passes belongs to death. He says, um, we are dying every day, right? We're dying every minute. So I don't think about, oh, I have 40 years left if I live to be 70. I think, oh, I've already died 30 years, right? And this, remind, this, is, this, this brings me back to the presence to the present, this brings me to a place of stillness, and then it allows me to focus on whatever is in front of me at this moment, and I hope that's helpful for you guys. So, thank you very much, it's been awesome. And we can do some questions. And I, I have a couple of these coins uh, for the first people that ask questions, if you were on the fence with a question. So actually, on the, on the topic of Memento Mori, yes. my, uh, my five-year-old hit me with the question of death. Yes. The day. And so, if you were to think of a, uh, a parent's guide to stoicism, especially with your, with your yeah. kids, how would you approach the topic of mortality and death? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know. Thankfully, I haven't had to ask the I haven't had to answer the question yet. But you know, in a way, one of the reasons that question is so difficult is we're like flashing forward to like, what's this going to mean for them, right? Like we're, we make it much bigger than it actually is instead of like uh, probably a short, easily forgotten, uh, you know, spur of the moment thing. Like I don't stress out when they ask me about other random stuff, right? I just so I'd probably just answer honestly uh, and straightforwardly and then 
Uh, they probably want to watch Paw Patrol after that. So you know what I mean? Like, I, I think one of the reasons that things stress us out is instead of thinking about what it is, like, hey, this person has a question about uh, reality. Am I going to answer it or not? We're thinking about, well, I don't want to mess them up, you know? Or like, if I answer this question, then I'm going to have to answer another question and then another, you know what I mean? We're, we extrapolate out. We go, if I, if I let them do this to me right now, what is my life going to look like? When really we should just think about, you know, the, pre the what, what's immediately in front of us. Yeah, here. That's closer. Other than working on your farm, what other hobbies do you have? Yeah, um, so for me, I run and swim every day. Those are sort of my hobbies. Uh, working on the farm is a, is a big one. And then like outdoorsy stuff like hunting and fishing and that sort of thing. But I, I, like, to, I like hobbies that get you outside, that get you active. Um, for me, having a sort of a creative uh, but sort of like profession that requires me to sit a lot, I want to do things that are the opposite of that, you know. Um, so scrapbooking or something is not going to be a fun hobby for me. But, you know, if, if you, you know, work at a restaurant, maybe it is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we can do you first. Yeah. One of the things you talked about was managing your time and showed your pristine calendar. You work at Google where there's a lot of demands inbound. Sure. The calendar looks super full. I'm like, oh, that's a productive day. But yeah. This is kind of taking that opposite view. So how can we message this maybe to peers, teams, without being yeah. rude? Without no, I'm a maker and clearing my schedule. Yeah, I, I, I do really like Paul Graham's essay on makers versus managers and sort of deciding like, hey, like my job is it, knowing really clearly, is, it, is your job to be in meetings all day? Maybe it is, as it is for a lot of managers. Or are you actually expected to make something, in which case you have to be actively not being in meetings, right? And so, so having some awareness about where's, where you fit in that thing is, is important. Um, for me, I, I, there's a, Marcus really says, what if you went through life asking yourself at every moment, is this necessary? And so the question for me is like, oh, do I, is this actually, does this meeting actually need to happen or could it be a phone call? And then does this phone call actually need to happen or could it be an email? Uh, does this email even need to happen, or could we just pretend this doesn't matter? You know what I mean? Like, uh, and so just really being being ruthless. Like, uh, I I saw a T-shirt uh, that was like, "Don't say maybe when you want to say no." You know, like so be like, not being afraid to be the bad guy on stuff and going like, "Guys, like this doesn't need to happen," or like, "Sorry, I can't make it. Send me a recap after." Um, and then if you can't, if if that's trouble uh, difficult politically, uh, just pretend to be sick a lot. You know, uh, so, you can, so you can get your actual work done. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like one of the great things about being a writer is I can go, I'm sorry, I'm on book deadline. But I'm always on book deadline. I just say this for the things that, you know, I don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. So um, was yeah. there an inflection point where you realized you wanted to write your first book? And what was the actual experience like? So the rule I usually give people who are thinking about writing books is like, can you not do it, right? Like, if you cannot do it, definitely don't do it, right? It's like, do you have to do it? So I had ideas for books, and the fact that those books didn't become books was a sign that they weren't the right book, and that book I felt like it would be painful if I didn't do it. And that's kind of the, because a book is a painful process, so if, if you can skip that, you should definitely skip it. So um, it's, re it's really thinking about, like, is this the thing I feel like I was put on this planet to do? Not like, will this help me get speaking gigs? This is a good way to make money. There's many better ways to make, to make money and spend your time than writing books. So if you're going to do it, you should do it because it's like deeply important to you. And it, it, it's, I mean, it's rewarding in many ways and enjoyable, but it's also like, there, it's, it's fun, but there's things that are a lot more fun. <laughs> and so I'm not doing it for fun. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, bad throw. It's uh, right there. I actually had uh, two for you. So the first one, in terms of routine, I can do routine on the trip with myself. Yeah. With uh, three little kids who try and uh, throw them off. Yeah, of course. I'm uh, wondering if you have any advice you might have on how you keep that routine um, while also not you know, necessarily neglecting sure. the things that you know, you're supposed to so for me, the transition became going from having routine to having routines, plural. So um, it being like my routine is a collection of, th of things that I do every day. 
and then having the flexibility to allow the deck to be shuffled. If somebody wakes up early, or somebody wakes up late, or something goes long, these are still the things I'm trying to do every day. And if I have my choice, I want to do them in a certain order. But being able to be flexible about having routines is really great. Because that also allows you to absorb travel, or you know, sick, being sick, or you know, big interruptions is like, OK, Here's what I do when I'm on the road. Here's what I do when I wake up at 7. But here's how I do it if I wake up at 9. You know, like having the Or if I had to work late, here's what I do instead. Like having, having backup plans and backup plans for the backup plans is the way to do it, I think. Yeah. What's your favorite book? Uh, of all time? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think Meditations is one of the, the sort of most unique historical documents in that it's the most powerful person in the world writing really honestly and vulnerably to themselves, not for an audience. Um, so I'd probably start there. Hi. Hey. Um, I was wondering how yeah. you determine things that you want to view as the present versus things that are worth learning from the past. So for example, you mentioned like news you should ingest and uh, feel about after it's already occurred. Yeah. Um, but some things you kind of, I mean, part of life is reacting to the current moment. So yeah. where, where you make that distinction? No, that's a, that's a great question. I think uh, I'm a huge reader and student of history that's like at the core of all my books. So I'm not saying you only focus on what's in front of you. Uh, I'm saying that when you're consuming information, you want to consume information that has a long half-life not information that's likely to be rendered irrelevant by the next piece of information, right? So uh, I would rather, it's like if I, if I only have this present moment and I'm going to read a book, or I'm going to consume information, I want to read a book about something that definitely did happen and what people learn from it, not is this going to happen or not going to happen? You know, is this based on good information or bad information? Uh, you know, I don't want to read speculation. I don't want to read you know, uh, off-the-cuff opinions about things. I want to really go towards where we have some established wisdom or insight, because that's likely to help me both in the present and in the future. All right, I only got one more coin, so it's perfect. Hi. So building off of that question, as well as the writing question, um, in your books, there's so many different stories and so much research that has gone into all of it. How do you formulate your process from deciding what you're going to read to what's yeah. important to include, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, there's an element of randomness to it, but it's, it's also, I try to be intentional about it, so it's like I want to learn about all the different things that I don't know. So I'm always sort of going into deep dives of topics that I don't have familiarity into that I want to study. And then when I'm reading, I'm very intentional about, um, so I'm, I'm, I, I tend to only read physical books. I read them. Uh, I'm taking notes in them as I'm reading. I'm folding pages. Then I'm, uh, afterwards, I sort of let it sit for a little bit. Then I synthesize that information onto uh, note cards. I use four by six note cards. Then I organize those note cards in uh, basically boxes. And, and those, the, those stacks of note cards, when they tend to uh, uncover patterns, become the books. And then so it's like, oh, I've, you know, I've found a lot of interesting stuff about obstacles. Maybe I'll write a book about that. Or ego, maybe I'll write about a, a book about this. Uh, stillness came from, from one quote that I found in one book. And then it was like, I, it sort of retroactively made me realize I'd been collecting stuff about this, not knowing that's what I was doing or why I was doing it. Um, <clears throat> But the process of interacting with the information in multiple mediums and it being somewhat labor intensive is really important. Like, I'm not a big fan of like Kindle highlights or you know an Evernote file where these things are really just going in a black hole. Like you think you're remembering them, but you're not. Like it's the process of writing them down and moving them and being able to physically touch them and then have to go, oh, okay. Here, I mentioned some story, and it's on page 62 in this book, and then I've got to go to my shelf and get it down and read it again. That, like, by the time something appears in the books or in one of my talks, I've interacted with this story so many times in so many different ways that I have a recall for it and a familiarity, and I feel like it gets integrated into like, my consciousness in a way that you know, just highlighting it or, or, or writing a memo to myself on my phone wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys.